is no one in here who does not know who Alan Turing is, uh, whether it's through the imitation game, which of course has uh, brought his attention to innumerable people in this country who've never heard of him. And uh, I was talking to uh, our, our speaker this morning, and uh, uh, there, there is of course uh, people in Great Britain who are also who are equally well recognized as Alan Turing, but I think he is probably the best name known to the American audiences right now as virtually being the father of the of the computer. If it wasn't for Alan Turing, we would not be fiddling with the internet at home uh, at our desks. So uh, it's with great pleasure this evening that I introduce Sir Dermot Turing, and Sir Dermot is the nephew of Sir Alan Turing, educated at Sherburne and King's College, Cambridge, and after completing his uh, doctorate in philosophy and genetics at New College, Oxford, he moved into the legal profession. And he is currently uh, with Clifford Chance, which is a financial services and markets group where he is a partner. And that is London-based, I believe, is it not? And although Terman, uh, uh, Terman periodically gets to this country as well. Um, and I think we will get a feel for uh, Alan Turing and the sort of formation of Alan Turing and his later life in London. So please help me welcome Sir Dermot Turing. <laughs> I'm sorry. I also should just make a point. The book, which I had not, has just come out. And so it's Alan Turing decoded, decoded by Dermot Turing. Good to see you, Dermot. Well, thank you very much, and good evening, everybody. It's uh, quite an honor to have such a packed uh, house um, this evening. Um, uh, I'm going to focus on the aspects of Alan Turing's life where he has a sort of touch point with the United States. And uh, um, I can't begin with that, but uh, I thought that might, might uh, prove to be a sort of an interesting uh, angle to take on, on his life. Um, you might have wondered what this obscure thing was when, when, uh, when it came up. So um, I, should, ah, I should explain. The, the spies have given me back my notes. That's very helpful. Force of power. <laughs> yes, he took my papers away out of the waste paper basket. He's photocopied them with his, with his micro camera. And uh, um, anyway, yes, so right, I'm, I'm now back on course. OK, the, this, this slide um, is just to try and give you some sort of sense as to where the Turing's uh, at least say they came from. Um, this is a very ancient probably um, falsified family tree that uh, is, is in a, a terrible family book called The Lay of the Turings, which is in Victorian doggerel style poetry, telling you all the marvelous achievements of the many non-entities that are on, on this chart, going, going way back to 13, I can't really read it, it's 1316 or something. Um, if you believe it, then, then it's great. But what you will find in this chart is absolutely not a single mathematician, computer scientist, uh, or code breaker. Um, so that's all quite interesting. But uh, um, what you will find in that is a lot of civil servants, um, uh, reverend ministers of the Scottish Kirk, and, uh, and people such as that. And so that actually sets the scene for Alan Turing's childhood because uh, his parents, and in particular my grandfather, uh, worked for the Indian Civil Service, the part, the arm of the UK administration that was responsible for administering uh, Britain's most important colony, namely that in India. Um, and so my father, um, who's the little boy aged about nine months, sitting on this pony, that's the Rani Saib's pony. Um, he was born in India, and you can see this is a sort of classic British Raj picture. The bearer on the left of the photograph um, looks like a very young man. He's not wearing any shoes. My grandmother on the right of the photograph, as you can see, is wearing very nice shoes, and, uh, and no doubt my father's having a splendid time on the back of this pony. Um, 
Alan himself was not born in India, but that didn't mean that uh, the family had come back to the UK. This is a sort of classic pattern for um, the British Empire. The empire administrators stay in their uh, country, their host country, when and what they do with the children is that they will typically leave them with a foster family uh, back, back in the UK. So Alan was born in London, and after he'd been born, my father, who's the little boy on the right of this photograph, um, were left with a foster family um, and spent their childhood growing up in Britain when their parents were, were, were abroad. So the, the, what this was all about was finding a suitable foster family that would um, give these kids uh, a, a nice home. This photograph um, I picked out specifically not just because my grandmother's taste in hats, um, and um, you will note that they're on the beach. So this is the kind of hat that you wear to go to the beach. I'm sure you, sure you, sure you all, you all understand this. Um, uh, but this this photograph was taken in about 1915 um, during the middle of the First World War. And what's significant about this is that Granny had braved the U-boat menace. Bearing in mind that the U-boat war was not a creature of the Second World War, the U-boat problem. Um, was very significant in the First World War. So she had braved the U-boats to come home from India uh, to see, see her kids and take them to the beach. And uh, that, that, was, that was very remarkable because the U-boat war in the First World War was probably more successful from the German perspective than it was in the Second World War because the British Navy very obstinately did not introduce convoying until very close to the end of the war. So the sinking rate was massive, um, really very significant. Anyway, so Alan grows up with this foster family. Um, I think having probably uh, a quite happy childhood um, and uh, in the classic sort of British tradition is sent to uh, boarding school um, where he seems to have had an unremarkable but not very sporty um, uh, existence. And then later on he goes to Sherborne School in Dorset, which I also went to in subsequent years. And uh, those of you who studied the Alan Turing story may know that there, or you've seen the Imitation Game movie, may know that there's this uh, picture that we have of Alan Turing falling sort of hopelessly in love with this uh, more senior boy called Christopher Morecambe, uh, who then subsequently very tragically dies, aged, I think, 18, um, leaving Alan Turing bereft for the rest of his life. That, I'm afraid, is a bit of a myth. Uh, it's true that he formed a close friendship with Christopher Morecambe, um, but it's not true that uh, he was not sideways by Christopher's early death. And this is actually illustrated quite well by this um, little formula, which is, um, for those of you who come to an Alan Turing talk, you know there's going to be an equation at some point. So, so I thought I'd introduce the equation early so that you can sort of have that sense of relief um, once we've got through this. This equation, this is in, it's very interesting, this is, comes from um, a, a, an internal school magazine, which you can see is typewritten. This is 1928 or so. Uh, 28, 29, um, and you can see that um, uh, this is all about, it's called the weekly worm, and this is all about the kids who are sitting their Latin exam. There was an exam you had to pass called school certificate Latin in order to be eligible to get into Oxford or Cambridge. So the school was very, very keen to make sure that its kids had succeeded and got their unnecessary credit in school certificate Latin. And some kids, including Alan Turing, were very obstinately bad at Latin. Um, so the incentive that uh, the Latin master applied was in the form of this thing called Bonzo, which uh, you can see on the right-hand side of the slide. It's a bit difficult to make it out, but it's a rather unpleasant sort of brush sitting on the um, Latin master's chair. And you can imagine the brush is applied to a certain part of the body to help the child learn Latin better. 
Alan Turing's first formula appears in this magazine for the Latin students called the Weekly Worm. And the formula explains that there's a relationship between the success you'll have in your Latin exam and the number of times you get beaten by Bonzo, the, um, the size of the boy, you can see that you may be able to make it out, it says M equals weight of boy in pounds, um, and, um, uh, and, and so forth. And there's also something to do with the number of chocolate bars and the number of donuts that you eat and so forth. And these things are all related together in this complicated way. And he explains on the next page, which I won't show you, but uh, explains on the next page sort of how you apply the formula to make sure that you can maximise your uh, Latin credit. Um, what I get from this is Anne's sort of sense of humour and sort of uh, humanity at a point after Christopher Morecambe has died, and that makes me start thinking about the truth of the Morecambe-Turing myth. I actually think that the real significance lies in this lady. This is Christopher Morecambe's mother. I'm going to disappoint you now. I'll probably be hounded off the stage because I'm going to tell you a, a British truth which will offend every American that I am looking at this evening. <laughs> Mrs. Morecambe's m father invented the light bulb. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Mrs. Morecambe's father was not a man called Edison. He was called Sir Joseph Swan. And we Brits believe that the light bulb, like the computer, was uh, invented on our side of the pond. And I don't know, uh, if you'd like me to leave now, then, uh, then that's fine. But you will have paid to come to only half a talk. Um, she's a very remarkable woman because she had uh, not only this sort of pedigree rooted in scientific and engineering achievement, um, unlike Alan Turing, because Alan Turing's mother wasn't going to uh, admit to having a, uh, a father who'd invented the light bulb, but uh, there, there were some interesting ancestors, but nothing quite like Sir Joseph Swan. But the other thing about Mrs. Morecambe is that she had a, uh, well, she first of all allowed her kids to have a science lab in, in, their, in their house, which, uh, again, wasn't going to be permitted Shea Turing. Um, but the other, the other thing was that she was a sculptress and uh, a very accomplished one. She had commissions from you know, all, all sorts of um, uh, top-notch organisations, including Lloyds Bank put their, um, uh, their sort of main building had sculptures by her in it at one stage. And she let the kids come in and sort of chip marble in her studio and that kind of thing. This really sort of hands-on kind of stuff, which uh, Alan wasn't going to get at home. And it's very interesting because he didn't meet... He met her once before Christopher Morecambe had died. And then after Christopher Morecambe had died, he was going on holiday with the Morecambe family and he was staying in very close contact with Mrs Morecambe for over ten years. So, and, and I think this is quite significant because while he was having this friendship with what to me looks like a sort of a mother substitute. Um, he's also working on his famous paper on computable numbers where he set out this blueprint for uh, a universal programmable computing machine. And he's explaining uh, through his letters and on his visits, and you can see this from Mrs. Morecambe's diary, he's been explaining to her how this concept works and he's working on something which is very, very significant, which is essentially turning mathematical processes into algorithms, essentially the predecessors of computer programs. And he sets out explaining to her um, about the rules of the Japanese game Go, you know, where you put little black and white counters down on a, on a grid pattern, and lots of you are nodding, so there's some Go experts in the audience. I don't, don't take me on, I'm useless at it. Um, but, and he sets out the rules of Go, and he's explaining to her how his universal computing machine could be programmed to do something like play Go, given an appropriate set of instructions. And he's explaining all this to her in, like, 1936, 37, you know, um, and it's, it's very interesting. He's explaining it to her because he's just written this paper, and he's been scooped by... This gentleman, the one on the right here, Alonzo Church. Professor Church uh, was working at Princeton uh, on the same problem in mathematical logic that Alan Turing had been trying to solve and was solving through his uh, 
device of a universal computing machine. Uh, Alonzo Church had tackled it in a much more abstract and theoretical way, but the outcome of this was that Alan's supervisor at Cambridge, a chap called Max Newman, had said, I think you should go to Princeton and work with Church for a year or two. And so Alan Turing came over here to the US um, in uh, 1936 and spent two years at Princeton um, working in loose association with Alonzo Church. But also significantly um, in rather closer association with the Institute for Advanced Study headed by John von Neumann, who's the man on the left-hand side of this uh, picture. And von Neumann's uh, uh, career trajectory is rather similar, in a sense, to that of Alan Turing, because um, you can see that von Neumann is standing there next to what is actually the US's first fully electronic, fully programmable uh, computer, which uh, was created by von Neumann in his IAS lab um, at Princeton immediately after the war. And von Neumann, as those of you who are computer scientists will know, is responsible for the von Neumann architecture, the, basically the blueprint for um, how uh, com computers uh, should be configured, at least for the purposes of uh, operating and programming. Um, and uh, his work on that was highly influential in Alan Turing's own work on designing the first uh, early British computers. So von Neumann and Turing's path, um, they'd crossed before, but uh, um, at, at Princeton, uh, I'm not going to say they worked very closely together, but they were certainly in association with each other, uh, even to the point where von Neumann uh, offered Alan a job in 1938. Uh, Alan turned it down because I think by that stage he had been approached, if not recruited, to work at Bletchley Park. You all know what happened at Bletchley Park. So you're going to now ask me why I've put up this rather peculiar drawing of um, a man who looks a bit like a rabbit. This is the talent agent. This is a chap called Frank Adcock. He is a veteran of Room 40. And as you're all good spies, you will know that Room 40 is the co-breaking operation which was uh, taking place under the auspices of the Royal Navy during the First World War and was not only successful in breaking the uh, German uh, Imperial Marine Codes, uh, but most significantly for breaking the Zimmermann Telegram, which is the thing that brought the US into the war. Frank Adcock had been one of the Room 40 veterans, and this drawing of him, this caricature of him, was done by one of his Room 40 colleagues at the end of the First World War. The significance of him is that along with a really ridiculously large number of other Room 40 veterans, he was a fellow of King's College, Cambridge, where Alan was also a fellow. So high table conversation seems to have led an awful lot of King's College fellows in the late 1930s as being on the list of men of the professor type who were on the emergency list to be called up to work at Bletchley Park in the event of hostilities with Germany. So in 1938, when Alan Turing comes back from Princeton, he is recruited by Adcock and the then head of uh, Bletchley Park. And uh, he's sent on a code-breaking course in January 1939, and he is introduced to the mysteries of the Enigma machine then. And he starts work on the theoretical uh, options for breaking the Enigma machine uh, as early as uh, that course took place, so early 1939, so that when war does break out in September 1939, it's just really a matter of changing locations rather than actually changing the nature of what he was doing. So here we go. This is Bletchley Park. This is um, the... It, looks, it actually looks um, rather 
clean and uh, neat and elegant even in, in this photograph, but the photographer has carefully chosen an angle so that you can't quite see the architectural absurdities of it. Um, later, later in the war, um, uh, a number of American servicemen were posted to work at Bletchley Park. One of them was a, uh, an architect in uniform, a chap called Landis Gores, and uh, he brought his architect's pen to bear on the ghastliness of the architecture of uh, Bletchley Park. And he starts off a long, a long, breathless paragraph on it, which begins that Bletchley Park is a maudlin and monstrous pile. So you get, you get the sense that it's, it's actually... Um, um, these days we're perhaps a bit more forgiving of it, knowing, knowing what, what happened there. But uh, um, anyway, so Alan was put to, put to work on the... Um, uh, Enigma codes there. Um, the reality is, I'm afraid, that um, the boffins from Cambridge were not put in the mansion. That's where the administration took place. They were put into these wooden huts, and those you, those brick walls might sort of surprise you. That that was because the Germans had this nasty habit of dropping bombs on places they didn't like. So the the brick walls are around, they're about um, a foot 18 inches around the outsides of the wooden buildings to prevent the wooden buildings um, collapsing in case a bomb drops in the grounds. And there was one occasion when Bletchley Park was bombed. Not deliberately, we think it was uh, a bomber returning from uh, the more northerly uh, um, industrial parts of Britain and uh, just, just jettisoning uh, un unused bombs. So um, no, nobody, nobody, nobody was injured, none of the buildings suffered. But you can see, you can just imagine the working conditions in these, in these huts with the, these blast walls around the outside where you keep out the air and the light. It must have been uh, uh, rather unpleasant. The reality was not at all like the elegant mansion. Anyway, what his creation while he was there was this thing, the, the bomb. Um, the purpose of the bomb is to try and find the settings of the Enigma machine. You'll recall that Enigma machines typically have three rotors, which you can then, uh, you have to choose which rotors they're in and, and then make sure that they're all at the right starting position. And then there's a plug board on the front, which massively increases the number of possible permutations of the way the machine can be set up. And the, both the sender and the receiver have to have a machine set up in the same way so as to be able to... Uh, uh, correctly decrypt the message. So the real challenge for the Enigma codebreakers was to find out what's the configuration in which the machine was set up for sending out the messages that day. So this is what the bomb was designed to do. And you can see that there are these rows of three uh, sets of rotors. Those are mimicking the three rotors in the machine. But you've got a whole bank of them all set up in parallel. And the technique is this is Alan Turing's clever idea. What you do is you guess at the, what the German text of the message you've intercepted would be, and you match that up to the intercept that you've actually got, and then you test on each of the handful of selected positions in these messages whether there is a configuration, a setup configuration of the Enigma machine that could have turned that plain text into that observed ciphertext message that you intercepted. So you run, run all three rotors through all 17,576 permutations uh, and then uh, test to see if there's any plausible, plausible solution. So it just massively simplifies the code-breaking exercise by using a machine to defeat a machine. The interesting thing I found out about this was that his work designing this thing was basically all done by Christmas 1939. At that point, uh, uh, unless you're Polish, the war in Europe was not yet a hot war. In, it was, uh, the Brits called it the phony war because there, weren't really, there wasn't really anything happening except at sea uh, in terms of um, uh, hostility. So that, that raises this sort of difficult question. Well, what on earth did Alan Turing spend the rest of his war doing? If he'd done his most significant thing by Christmas 1939, what, did he then take the next four and a half years off? You know, um, well, the answer is no, he didn't. There was plenty still to do on the uh, code-breaking front, uh, particularly on the naval code-breaking front, for the next two or three years. But then 
really by mid-1942, uh, Enigma code breaking had sort of become an industrialised thing. The, they got an, enough bombs up and running for it to be uh, pretty much the kind of thing you don't need the inventor to do. So that, um, they got thousands of staff of Bletchley Park um, work, working on the actual process of code breaking as opposed to the invention of theories of code breaking. So he did need to find a different role. Um, and then it's quite significant because the turning point from his previous role as a code breaker into something else starts when he visited the US on a secret mission in November 1942. And he was sent to this place. Um, this is a building in Manhattan on the west side. Um, and uh, you can see there's a train going through it, which is sort of to we Brits, this is a very weird idea that you should have a train going through the middle of a building. But that's, uh, Alan Turing was not sent to investigate railway technology, I can assure you of that. Um, this building was where the US Army was uh, uh, having its own version of the bomb uh, created for it uh, in the what this building was actually the Bell Labs research building um, at the time. So um, they, they were basically doing the technology and the engineering for the US Army. They were also working on something that's uh, quite interesting, which is voice encryption technology. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Uh, and that was also going on in this building. And Alan Turing had been sent to go and uh, uh, check out what was going on and uh, and partly to assist and partly also to sort of inspect. Um, the only problem was that this was essentially an army research facility and Alan Turing's security clearance had been given by the US Navy. Uh, and that laughter from the audience implies that you all understand that the US Army and the US Navy are different organizations and do not report to each other. So. There was a little bit of a problem, um, almost even a diplomatic incident. Um, it went all the way up to General George C. Marshall to resolve Alan Turing's security clearance. Um, it took him to work out that the US Army was not at war with the US Navy, but with Germany. Uh, and, uh, and, and therefore, it probably was OK. But this took, literally, it took a month to, to sort, sort this problem out. Um, meanwhile, Alan Turing went over to Dayton, Ohio, where this thing was being created by uh, a brilliant engineer called Joe Desch. This thing, well, you can see it's got f banks of four rotors on it. This is Joe Desch's solution to the four rotor Enigma machine, which had been introduced in 1942 by the Germans for uh, naval Enigma, for essentially to, for Dönitz to send out his instructions to the U-boats to attack the convoys. Um, late 1942 and early 1943 were the worst years of the Second World War for U-boat successes, um, well, uh, worst from the Allied perspective, um, best from the Germans' perspective. Um, the vast amount of tonnage sunk then, and this was really completely appalling because when they'd introduced this four-rotor machine, the three-rotor bombs were powerless to uh, get to the moment intelligence about the uh, whereabouts of U-boats. And unfortunately, code-breaking successes were not only on the Allied side. The Germans were able to read the Allied merchant naval code, and so they knew exactly where the convoys were, and we had no idea where the U-boats were. That problem was not fixed until uh, 1943 when Joe Desch's four rotor bombs came online and indeed the Bletchley Park team managed to get their own versions of four rotor bombs up and running, um, after which the uh, uh, success was turned around and we knew exactly where the U-boats were and they had no idea where our convoys were because we'd changed our codes. So, um, but, so Alan Turing went to Dayton to consult with Joe Desch on the, uh, on the uh, <coughs> US um, four-rotor bomb. 
<clears throat> and then eventually his security clearance came through and he was able to check out the Army's three-rotor bomb and also this bizarre piece of equipment. This is the piece of machinery which enabled Franklin D. Roosevelt and Winston Churchill to have telephone conversations without being listened to by the Germans. And Alan Turing had been sent specifically to the US to see whether this piece of machinery was secure. This is a highly secret mission which wasn't really known about much until recently when um, documents were declassified on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, and it was a monster. I mean, it really was a monster. It, I, I can never remember the statistics. They're, they're, so, they're so ridiculous. So I think it's, it weighed 40 tons and it had 50 racks of equipment. It's either, the, I always get the 40 and the 50 the wrong way around, so forgive me if I got it the wrong way around. But anyway, you can tell it's a monster. It's huge. It's the size of a room. Um, well, Alan Turing was able to send back to the UK a positive report on this. It's perfectly secure. However, you have to understand this. Because the Americans were going to operate the thing, they will be listening to these calls. So, you know, and there's a sort of you know, nod to the future there, isn't there? Um, this, thing, this, thing, this thing was so big, this thing was so big that when actually, you know, so he'd signed off on it, and so they shipped one over to the UK. Um, and it came over on, I think, the Queen Mary or the Queen Elizabeth or something. Um, and uh, they, had to find a, they had to find a room to put it in. And there were no rooms in Whitehall in London where the civil service operates that were big enough uh, and sufficiently close to ground level because something as heavy as that can't be put high up in a building. Um, so they ended up putting it in the basement of Selfridge's department store in Oxford Street. <laughs> but this prompted Alan Turing in his new role as essentially the security guy to talk, um, uh, to work on uh, this problem of voice encryption and see if it could be done in a slicker, less cumbersome kind of way than this terrible piece of machinery that was sitting in Selfridge's department store. So one of his projects, and it's only one of the projects he was working on for the rest of the war, was inventing this machine that you can see at the bottom of the slide, which was called Delilah, which is about the size of an Enigma machine, actually, and did the same job as the huge thing that was occupying uh, Selfridge's department store. Um, but this is quite interesting because he'd moved from Bletchley Park to a place that's about 10 miles up the road called Hanslope Park, which you can see in the main photo in the slide here. And this was uh, essentially a radio communications and security installation. It's still possibly one of the UK's most highly guarded secret facilities. Um, you can't go around there. You can go around Bletchley Park, by the way, but you can't go around Hanslope Park. Um, and what he was also working on during this period was essentially all aspects of machine, uh, uh, machines and their relationship to cryptology and cryptanalysis. So he was partly involved in the Colossus machine that was uh, used to uh, find the settings on the Lorentz enciphered uh, uh, messages. And um, he was also involved in things like uh, checking out the security of the technology that the allies were using to communicate with each other in, for example, through teleprinters and, and through traditional Morse code um, uh, encipherment. So uh, a completely different role for him in the second part of the war where he turned from being the code breaker into the security enforcer. That's uh, interesting to me because I never really believed that he'd spent the entire time on the Delilah project because he's a mathematician and completely hopeless when you put a soldering iron into his hand. So you don't really put him on an engineering project like that. I mean, he was involved, but not, not, the, not, not, doing, not doing the wiring. OK, so after the war, um, as we all know, he turned his mind to computer science and in particular the design of the first British um, electronic programmable computers. And I thought you might like to see this. This photograph is uh, the first British functioning programmable electronic computer. And 
doesn't it look dreadful? Um, uh, sort of wires hanging from the ceiling and sort of like jumbled up. I mean, you know, you talk about 40 racks and 50 tons or whatever. This didn't weigh 50 tons, but it's got, looks like the same amount of racks. And that American piece of equipment that we were looking at before looks much better organized than that thing, doesn't it? So, but this thing actually worked. Um, it had a huge memory. It had a memory of 1,024 bits. <laughs> yes, don't think it would run Windows, but never mind. Um, and it was the creature of the guy in the... I've shown his photograph on the right-hand side of the slide there. That's Max Newman. He was the one who uh, had set Alan Turing off in the, on the road of... Uh, uh, looking at that problem in mathematical logic all those years before, uh, which had led to the paper on computable numbers and Alan coming to Princeton. Incidentally, Max Newman spent several years at Princeton at roughly the same time. Max Newman also headed up the Colossus Laboratory at Bletchley Park. So uh, Max Newman and Alan Turing uh, were very close throughout the whole of their uh, careers. And in 1948, um, uh, Max Newman hired Alan Turing to come to Manchester to work with him in his computer laboratory where Alan Turing was allowed to program that thing. And, you know, that was, that was good. That was a, essentially, that was a prototype computer, and they were building a much better thing, which uh, Alan was then able to work on. Now, this is very significant because... At this point, Alan Turing abandons work on designing computers and designing programming manuals for computers and designing operating systems, all that kind of stuff that he'd been doing since 1945. And he starts work on developmental biology. Now, that just feels like a radical departure, but it's perhaps not that weird when you think about a couple of things that were going on. First of all, Max Newman, he's a topologist. His mathematical specialism is about shapes of things and how if you squeeze them, you know, do the knots unravel and can you, and, uh, and, you know, the shape and form and manipulation. Also, Alan Turing has been closely w uh, involved with a group of biologists and mathematicians who are looking at problems of command and control, and in particular, command and control in machines and even organisms, which you can perceive as being a sort of machine. How does, uh, for example, um, a robot uh, that's... Uh, I don't know, what do you do? You travel if you're a robot, I suppose. A robot travelling down, down a corridor realises it's about to bump into a wall. What it needs to do is have, have some sort of uh, visual or other sensor that tells it that it's approaching a wall, and that needs to... That piece of information that comes from that sensor needs to feed back and tell the robot to turn left to avoid running into the wall. That kind of problem about command and control in machines, which is essentially a computing problem, was also being looked at in these seminars by a bunch of biologists who were looking at exactly the same thing and were trying to work out how the nervous system was processing similar sorts of information. And he'd been attending these seminars for a couple of years where the biologists and the mathematicians were working very, very closely together. Very interesting group of people. And so... He starts working on what he calls the chemical basis of morphogenesis. Can we explain through mathematical modeling and the idea, a theoretical idea, there might be chemicals that uh, are there present in cells of uh, forming organisms that uh, things like the patterns on a Frisian cow, for example, might uh, uh, come out to be the way that they are. So um, this paper that he wrote uh, in 1951 um, sets out his uh, theory on this, and he can explain the, the blobs that you've got on that slide, a, a diagram taken from, from his paper. Um, and he then started working on uh, the question about 
what, how do um, plants know whether to send out their leaves and their buds in, in particular points on their stem. So the drawing in the bottom right hand corner of the slide is uh, it's the growth tip of something like an asparagus plant. So you're looking vertically down at an asparagus tip and where the little black blobs are and where the uh, little florets come out on, on that. So he reckoned he could explain this stuff through his, uh, through his equations. And let me, if this works, if this works, I have a, no, I might need some technical, technical help here. Um, I have a model of the uh, equations in action, which I should be able to show you. The only thing is I, ah, oh, I've got it, I've got it. Okay, with luck that will come up. Okay, now you can see this is like pretty gray, but the equations start to work and you can see the chemicals are at work and they're creating differences across the slide. You can see now you've got some quite obvious patterns forming there. And now they're quite bright and quite distinctive. It doesn't look gray at all. And this is, this is just a, this is just a, uh, a simulation um, of how, how the equations might work, turn into stripes or um, um, the, there's other ways you can set it up to make it different anyway so you get the you get the general idea I need to get back to the slides how do I do that yep we're there okay all right so this is some of his work on on plants these are um, original drawings of his that are in the archive at King's College Cambridge um, this picture on the left uh, I'll explain to you in just a second, but I'll, let me let me set set this one running so you can see he's also working on uh, the shape of some rather strange microscopic creatures that you found in the found, find in the mud at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, which are called radiolaria. Um, and while the radiolaria are demonstrating themselves to you, let me explain the uh, picture on the left. If you imagine a plant stem and you took a razor blade and you slit it down the back and then you unpeeled the stem, you would find all the points where the leaves or branches come out and they come into these parallel um, spirals and the parallel spirals tend to have a repeat pattern around the stem and when you num count the number of uh, uh, leaves or side branches that there are in the um, uh, uh, in, in a complete spiral you tend to find that they are in the the numbers are in the Fibonacci series so there are mathematical patterns appearing in in nature so he was working he was working on those he reckoned he could explain those through his equations as well as the points of the where the spines come out on the radial area that you saw going through that sequence there and that was what he was working on and it's unfinished work that he was working on at the time of his death now of course we all know that Alan Turing was prosecuted in 1952 for gross indecency which means basically having homosexual activities with another man in a private place that was a criminal offense in the UK in 1952 and he was sentenced to uh, take therapy for this and therapy I think everybody assumed at the time that therapy was going to involve psychiatry and probably not a great deal more than that but in his case it uh, also involved him having to have this wear this implant of uh, synthetic estrogen for a year um, and heaven knows how that screwed him up anyway we all know that the uh, outcome of it was that in 1954 uh, on a very gloomy uh, bank holiday weekend in the UK, he took his own life uh, by uh, uh, taking some cyanide that he'd made in his own laboratory in his own house. Um, and I finished with this slide, which is um, uh, to try and talk a little bit about the theory that actually he didn't take his own life and the whole thing was a terrible accident. 
Um, sort of slight struggle to read this, but I think what this document, which is the oddest thing in the archive at King's College, Cambridge, which is mostly things like Alan Turing's papers and drawings and letters and stuff, it also includes this spoon. And the little label on it says, this is a spoon which I found in Alan Turing's laboratory. It is similar to the one which he gold-plated himself it is quite probable he was intending to gold plate this one using cyanide of potassium of his own manufacture. And then that's signed by Sarah Turing. So that's my grandmother, Alan's mother. She firmly believed in the theory that Alan Turing's death was an accident. And the strength of her belief has actually led to a number of people quite a significant number of people um, also believing that uh, Alan Turing's death was an accident or even possibly something more sinister. People like their spies to have uh, you know, come, come to sort of a sticky end through some kind of nefarious uh, goings on. Uh, unfortunately, the truth of it is all very much uh, less romantic than that. Um, I think there's plenty of evidence to indicate that uh, uh, he was going through a pretty rotten period and uh, that he did take his own life and there's plenty of, um, uh, there's enough evidence for the coroner to conclude that uh, he deliberately taken the cyanide. So why do all these people think that it was an accident? Well, one of the things that I've um, uncovered to some extent um, in the course of the research that I've done is that there was actually a little conspiracy going on here. There was a conspiracy to try and lessen the blow for my grandmother. Can you imagine how difficult it must be to lose a child, but then to lose a child who's committed suicide? I think that must be really very difficult to cope with. So my father initiated a sort of a conspiracy which included Alan's psychiatrist, the local undertaker, uh, and various others to... Uh, ensure that every effort was made to encourage my grandmother in the belief that it had been an accident because that was the way that she would cope with it best, even though the evidence pointed the other way. And I think that the deception plan probably was pretty successful because it not only took her in, but it's, um, it's also taken a few others in as well. But there's, there's, there's documentary evidence that that deception plan was in place. So uh, that, that's, that's been quite an interesting, interesting discovery. Anyway, um, so I've brought it to an end on Alan's death, which is probably the logical place to stop. But I think he would probably have preferred us to think about things like the chemical basis of morphogenesis, the problem of computable numbers, um, and some of the other work that he'd done in mathematical logic, rather than the circumstances of his end. So that is the right place to end. Thank you so much. Very good. Again, very stimulating presentation. Uh, Alan Turing, decoded by Dermot Turing, which is in the back. We have some copies. If I didn't say so before, I'm Peter Ernest, executive director of the museum. And uh, Dermot has said he'd be glad to take some questions here at the end of the presentation. Uh, I would try and hold formulas and equations down to a minimum <laughs> if you can. OK? Uh, we have one so, right back And if here. you would wait for the mic so everyone can hear the question. Thank you. Hi, thank you for your time. Um, I wanted to know if um, who took over his research, the research that he had and completed, uh, or how you know how many scientists did any scientists take over the the research that he didn't complete before he passed before he died? Okay, there's there's a there's a danger even without doing the equations that the, I could give you a thirty minute response, but let me try and give you some highlights from that. Um, Bernard Richards, who was um, Alan Turing's last research student, um, did manage to complete his work on radial area without Alan's supervision. So he actually wrote up his work and he proved that Alan Turing's equations worked for these weird things uh, that, that you see on the right-hand side of this, this mm. slide. So, but he had to sort of basically self-direct for the last year of his uh, thesis. Um, he then subsequently went on and had an amazing career as a 
sort of a medical technologist. So having started off being a mathematician, ended up creating medical technology, which is just very interesting. But actually, the thing is that nobody really did pick up on the chemical basis of morphogenesis and Alan's equations and his theories about uh, uh, growth and form. And the reason for that, I think, primarily, is that Watson and Crick, and Rosie Franklin always gets ignored in this, um, came up with a discovery of the structure of DNA at a, roughly the same time that this work was going on. And that just captured the imagination of the biologists. And for the next 40 or 50 years, you never got a grant to do any research in developmental biology unless you could say it was something to do with DNA. And it's only in the last, let's say, five years that developmental biology has really started to broaden out and look at some other, other possibilities. And they've discovered that Alan Turing's theories actually explain some aspects of developmental biology that some of the old theories really um, you know, just, just conflict with. So um, I'm not sure that quite answers your question, but it's, a, it's the best I can do. <laughs> OK. Yes, one, there's one way in the back there, Laura, I see. Hi, Peter. Um, I have a question about no one coming to his defense in terms of explaining his work during World War II uh, when he was charged with the Homosexual Act that could have reduced or changed his uh, sentence. I know he didn't, I've been told he didn't say anything about it. But I'm surprised that no one uh, whom he knew would have come to his defense to try to lessen the, um, the sentencing. Oh, well, OK. L l let me explain that in a bit more detail. Um, <clears throat> he pleaded guilty, which was clearly the right thing to do, because there was no, there was no question about the correctness of the facts that were presented to the court. There was no no possibility of challenging the evidence. And if they had challenged it and he'd still have been found guilty, then much worse consequences would have happened. So basically, there was a choice um, on which Alan took advice and I think arguably took, uh, took the advice in the correct way. The other people who had been uh, tried on the same day for the same offence, this is not his... Um, uh, his partner, but uh, there, were, there were three other groups of men who were tried for the same offence on the same day. What happened to them was they all ended up getting fined. Uh, they didn't go to prison, but they ended up getting fined, and they got criminal records. If Alan Turing had been fined and got a criminal record, he would probably have lost his job. So the alternative was to be dealt with uh, uh, and put on probation, which is what happened to him. And I think that he was advised that if he went on probation and took this therapy course, then he would be able to keep his job and avoid having a criminal record. So I think that that was actually... It, and, and that was facilitated, that course of um, sentencing was facilitated for the judge by two character witnesses. And both of those character witnesses had been at Bletchley Park. One of them was Max Newman, who was the Alan Turing's then boss in 1952. And also one of the uh, people who'd worked with Alan Turing at Bletchley Park um, uh, when Alan Turing was doing his work on the, uh, on the Enigma codes, um, who was by then a senior officer at GCHQ, which is, as you know, British equivalent of the NSA and uh, was the successor organization to Bletchley Park by 1952. So I don't, think, I don't think it would be fair to say that nobody came to his defense. In fact, I think everybody was rallying round and was doing their best to make sure that he kept his job and, uh, uh, and got the best possible outcome uh, from a very unfortunate set of events. So uh, I think there's this tendency that we have to say that an uncaring and unthinking establishment handed Alan Turing to his death. That bit, I think I've got a bit of a problem with that characterization of these events. The law was uh, a mess and for all sorts of uh, jurisprudential reasons was illogical and unfair and morally wrong and, you know, we can 
think of lots more adjectives to, to d d describe it. But um, mm -hmm. I think what was unexpected, and this, this bizarre thing that he ended up having this hormone treatment, which was a very rare thing given to, given to offenders in those days. And uh, I don't think anybody expected that to happen or indeed thought about the consequences of it. So that's the bit, that's the bit that I'm unhappy with. And frankly, I think it was probably illegal to uh, ask him to undergo that uh, treatment as well. I mean, um, you have an amazing thing here, which is he copied out, dare I say it, from uh, a UK piece of legislation called the Bill of Rights 1688. You called it the Bill of Rights too, and it's in exactly the same words. And you have a lot more jurisprudence on it here than we do in the UK about this phrase in it, which says that you shall not uh, permit people to suffer cruel and unusual punishment. Because ours was written in 1688, it's rather more badly spelt than yours, but, uh, <laughs> but it's, the same, it's the same piece of constitutional law, and if anybody can convince me that hormone treatment, sub to which you have no choice, you know, you don't volunteer for this thing, it's mm -hmm. just imposed upon you, is anything other than cruel and unusual punishment. You know, I mean, it's, you know, the Supreme Court would not have a problem saying it's cruel and unusual punishment in this country. Nobody thought about it in the UK. Sorry, that was a very long and emotional answer to a very simple question. But I'm sorry to have gone on. Do uh, right here, Laura, yeah. Thank you for that interesting lecture. Could you talk about your own personal circumstances and when and how you learned about your uncle, what your family thought about him at the time, and what led you to write the book? Okay, there's five questions for the price of one here. So, uh, um, <laughs> um, yes, uh, like everybody in this room, um, I really didn't know anything much about Alan Turing when I was growing up. Um, it's not everybody that has a fellow of the Royal Society in their family, and so there's obviously something remarkable about this guy, but let's not remember, let's not forget that we're not really any of us um, uh, computer scientists, uh, at least we weren't in the 1970s. You know, you had to be a very special person to be a computer scientist in the 1970s. So very few of us had ever heard of Alan Turing. Um, nobody can spell the name, and he basically wasn't... Uh, anybody that anybody had heard of until in the mid-1970s they started revealing little tiny fragments, bits of nanodata about what had happened at Bletchley Park during the war. And between about the mid-1970s and mid-1980s it became more and more apparent that Alan Turing's role at Bletchley Park had been both significant and successful. And I think that by that stage a few more people had heard of him. And then an amazing thing came along. You got a computer on your desk. Nobody got a computer on their desk until about 1992. But once everybody got computers on their desk, then people started asking about where computers had come from. Ever before, they wanted computers to go away. And perhaps you still want your computer to go away when it's sort of having a bad day. But, uh, but everybody's got them, and that means that people start asking questions about where they came from, who invented this thing, to which, of course, there isn't a simple answer. But you know, John von Neumann and Alan Turing's name tend to come up in that, in that context. So I think really by, let's say, 10 years ago, many more people had heard about Alan Turing. And, you know, I mean, that, that just describes my sort of effectively dis life discovery of, of the man uh, uh, as well. Um, what led me to write the book? Some of you may have seen a movie you may have seen some James Bond movies because you're here at the Spy Museum and uh, here we celebrate the James Bond movies. I'm talking about a different one. Um, that symbolizes for me, if you like, some of the um, image that we carry around of Alan Turing that's painted by actors doing their best to bring a historical character to life and I don't criticise any of those actors for doing it in the way they've done, and I think some of them, Benedict Cumberbatch, I think is brilliant. But, uh, um, but you do end up taking away a picture of somebody that's come out of a movie screen or come out of a book that you've read, rather than necessarily the, the real person. So I, I really wanted to investigate whether 
that image that we, I mean, it's different for everybody, of course, but the images that we carry around of Alan Turing, are they real? You know, was he, for example, a solitary, unapproachable weirdo that, uh, you know, only, only people with a higher degree in mathematics could actually communicate with? Um, these, I mean, that's just one of several several myths. And another one, as I talked about earlier, was sort of you know this business about the Christopher Morcom relationship when he was a teenager. Um, I wanted to just investigate these, try and do this open-mindedly. I also want to investigate the accident theory, you know, and try and do these open-mindedly um, to sort of see you know where the truth really lies. Um, I'm not sure I can do that completely objectively, but you know I've had a, I've had a go at it. But some of the myths turn out to be sort of sort of true. Some of them turn out to be a bit more complicated than that. Some of them turn out to be true. So, um, you know, the, the one about the mistreatment in the 1950s, you know, I mean, I think that turns out to be largely true. You know, this business about this hormone treatment, it's completely absurd. But uh, um, anyway, sorry, that's a... I may have answered three of your five, but I hope you'll forgive me the other two. <laughs> Dermot, you raised uh, the movies, and I haven't looked up the name Kira Knightley in your index. <laughs> but I wonder if you could tell us if there's any truth to the Kira Knightley uh, figure in the movies at all in the, in the imitation game. Um, yeah, so Alan Turing's relationship with Kira Knightley. Well, um, uh, unfortunately, she's too young to have met him personally. Uh, but the character that she plays, um, Joan Clark, um, there really was a code breaker, a woman code breaker at Bletchley Park um, uh, called uh, Joan Clark, who was briefly engaged to Alan Turing for a short period. And, and there's quite, I mean, if you'll forgive me a, a little bit of a speech on that. Um, uh, I think this is all very, very interesting because um, many people don't realise that the vast majority of workers at Bletchley Park were not the men co code breakers. They were the they were they were women. There were thousands and thousands, literally, of women working at Bletchley Park. They were doing, they were operating the machinery. They were working as translators. They were working as communications clerks. You know that that kind mm. of role. Um, where. In the U.S. code-breaking operation at Arlington Hall, you had waves doing the essentially low-grade jobs. At Bletchley Park, we had the U.K. equivalent of waves, which are called wrens. So, um, women, enlisted women in the Royal Navy, um, doing doing essentially the low-grade jobs. There were a very, very small number of women who were elevated to the code-breaker roles. Um, the jobs that were normally reserved for the men in the 1940s. So Joan Clark's a very remarkable woman. She was a Cambridge maths graduate, uh, and along with this other handful of women, was able to get herself promoted into the code-breaking grades to do something where she could actually use her brain. And she was put in Alan Turing's hut to work on the naval codes, uh, naval enigma with him. And... Um, I think probably for the first time in his life he'd actually come across a female person that he could actually have the sort of conversations that he had with you know his male mathematically minded colleagues and so that's that's what sort of led to the, um, this relationship between them and and uh, uh, and as I say they, they they did get engaged but um, given the incompatibility of their sexual orientations, this really wasn't ever going to work out. So um, after, after a while, he explained to her um, sort of how he, how he was, and uh, they agreed to the, that it wasn't going, going to um, uh, be the recipe for a happy marriage. So, uh, but, I mean, they remained, they remained friends for the rest of their lives. So, Other questions? Uh, yes. Hi, hi, thank you very much. Um, I have a question about um, what do you think influenced Alan's atheism throughout his life? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't, didn't, didn't quite... What do you think influenced Alan's atheism throughout his life? Um, I can't give you a complete answer to that, so it's speculation, if you like, but um, uh, my sense is that... Uh, he is approaching things from a viewpoint of a, somebody who's studied the universe and thinks of things in purely scientific uh, and 
possibly mathematical ways and to impose some sort of layer of spiritualism or mysticism on top of it is not going to quite fit. However, there's a couple of things that I need to put into the equation to balance that out, which is why the answer to your question is quite complex. Um, at the beginning, r relatively at the beginning of his life, when he's still a teenager, Mrs. Morecambe asked him to write something on the nature of spirit. And don't forget, this is a lady who's grieving for the loss of her younger son. Um, and Alan knows that this piece that he's been asked to write by Mrs. Morecambe is going to be read not only by Mrs. Morecambe, but also by his own mother, who's uh, uh, a high church, Church of England Christian, um, uh, who, and both, so both these ladies insist on church on Sundays and plenty of hymn singing and sort of, you know, good observance traditional mainstream Church of England um, observance, both of them. Um, as an atheist, he's struggling to write something. If you read his piece on the nature of spirit, he kind of does his best to talk in the kind of code that he's expected to write in. I think it strikes a false note. Other people, notably the people who put up an exhibition in the UK Science Museum in London two or three years ago thought the opposite, so I may, have mis I may have misinterpreted it. So that's one thing which I would say. The other thing is, right at the end of his life, right at the end of his life, he, uh, two months before he died, he sent a series of postcards to his best friend, Robin Gandhi, who is a maths professor at the University of Leicester. And one of these is uh, almost psychedelic piece of poetry which um, it's a it's a quatrain which many of you will probably have um, come across which talks about hyper hy hyperboloids of wondrous light and I can't remember the way the rest of it goes but uh, um, it's it's very it's very otherworldly. It's not in the least bit scientific yet it comes in it's number eight in a series of uh, eight little um, the sort of almost haiku-like sort of observations. And, uh, and I think it's hard to say that somebody who could write that thing was totally devoid of spiritual influence. So, uh, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not really answering your question. I'm sorry, I know I'm not. But I'm telling you everything I know that could relate to it. I should probably better shut up because um, <laughs> I'll be even more incoherent if I continue. Back All right. <clears throat> Uh, <clears throat> recently, the British government infamously, uh, or might be the right word, pardoned Alan Turing uh, for his quote-unquote crimes. Uh, with that and with the movie coming out, and you may have inside information about this as a trustee for Bletchley Park, are there any future attempts or plans in the works to honor Turing in different ways? I know there's no, no Nobel Prize for computer science, but now that more people are talking about Turing and more people know about his achievements, are there any attempts in the future to bring, uh, I mean, he would have been honored in the last 30 years with the advent of the computer and how far it's gotten to this point. And clearly now we have the opportunity to do so. Uh, is there anything moving in this direction? Um, every few months there's something that happens along those lines. Whether there's anything sort of official or international, I'm, I'm not aware of. But um, some, sometimes, they, sometimes they're quite amusing, and sometimes they're uh, a, a bit more serious. Let me give you a couple of illustrations um, to um, hopefully lighten the mood a bit, having talked about atheism and suicide, where I'm sort of kind of in danger of being a bit gloomy. My favorite one for the Alan Turing Centenary Year events was a conference that was taking place on an island in China. Uh, which was going to celebrate all things about sort of computer science and Alan Turing and so forth, except that the proceedings were going to take place in Esperanto. <laughs> That's my favourite one. 
There has also been a plan to put Alan Turing on the back of a £10 note in the UK, because we have sort of famous people. Who, we, we circulate the pictures every so often so that you don't get bored with the you know, same, same ex-presidents that, uh, but, uh, um, so, so there was a plan to put Alan Turing on the back of the £10 note, but, uh, I'm afraid he's had to, uh, give, give way to, um, we decided we haven't had enough women on the back of, back of notes recently, so I'm afraid, uh, he had the wrong gender, so, so, he, uh, he, second, second place didn't, didn't quite, didn't quite work. Uh, um, so there are the, every year there's somebody suggesting something. There are statues going up all over the place, and we put commemorative plaques on walls all over the place. So you know there's a lot there's a lot going on in the UK. Um, it's really hard to see what governments could do, having both given an apology under Gordon Brown's government and a pardon under David Cameron's government. So uh, there's uh, you know I mean frankly from an official perspective. Um, you know, it might it might look embarrassing if people keep trying. Right. <clears throat> Other questions for Sir Dermot Turing? One hold back on, there. Hold on. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for a gorgeous talk. Um, my question is going to be very specific. It doesn't have a lot of components. Where does the name Turing come from? I had no idea the family tree went back so far. What's a Turing? Let's, let's look at it again because it's great, isn't it? Um, even if it's fake, it's, uh, it's just, just, just super. I mean, it's my... Apart from this, this is my favourite slide, my father on the runny size pony. But, um, OK, so you can see the, the, the chap at the top of the family tree, um, uh, somebody called Andrew Turing, T-U-R-Y-N. Um, it's the name of a nondescript, rather small hillside in Scotland in Aberdeenshire. If you um, take the road out of Aberdeen in a northerly direction, after about 15 miles you'll come across a town called Newbro, which is actually quite attractive. It's got a very nice golf course if you're um, that way inclined. Um, and um, uh, right next door to that is a, a tiny hamlet called Fovran, so F-O-V-E-R-A-N, which is where the Turings come from. So the Turings of Fovran, uh, it's a Scottish name, and it looks German, and when I go to Germany, people give me an umlaut, which is very nice of them. But, uh, <laughs> so, so, it's an umlaut-free piece of Scotland. <laughs> All right, thank you. Sir Dermot Turing, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. <clears throat>